Wow. It, it actually happened. After eight years, almost a dozen games, and God knows how many books, the long-awaited Five Nights at Freddy's movie is finally here. Or... Uh, to be more accurate, it came out like a week or two ago. Late to the party as always. And I know this channel's been a little bit FNAF-centric lately, but I mean, come on. I made two videos talking about all the trailers and hype leading up to the movie's release. I can't not make a video about the actual movie. It's not a professional review or anything, but I, I have to talk about this. Fair warning, there will be spoilers in this video. A lot of them, but uh, considering how late this is, you, you probably don't care. But first, I gotta give a huge shout out to today's sponsor, War Thunder. Tanks, ships, planes, helicopters, war. War! That's right, this is one of the most comprehensive vehicle combat games ever made. There's over 2,000 meticulously detailed vehicles to use in intense, dynamic PvP battles. All wrapped up with incredible graphics, 4K resolution, awesome music and sound effects, and more, all to make War Thunder an incredibly immersive experience. Heck, you don't even have traditional hit points. The game gauges damage through the actual physical damage done to the vehicles through their dynamic models and damage x-ray system. All of this is free to play right now on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation, and you can check it out by clicking the top link in this video's description. New players and those who haven't played for around six months can claim a large bonus pack with premium vehicles, a premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, and more. And you can only get this through my link, so check it out. Major thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring, and now, yeah, back to Five Nights at Freddy's. So, for a quick recap, the FNAF movie, based on the indie horror game series where you play as a security guard in a haunted Chuck E. Cheese type place, was first announced back in like 2015. But it quickly fell into development hell, being tossed around between companies, directors, blah, 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 whatever. So we've been waiting a long time for this movie. And since video game movies have only recently started figuring out how to be, well, good, I was nervous, but still pretty excited. So the day it released in theaters, I, of course, stayed home and watched it on Peacock. 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 Piss. So what did I think? Honestly, they kind of nailed it. Like, it's not perfect, and I'll go into that, but I came out of this being completely satisfied. It, let's talk about it. Big, major, all spoilers ahead, good lord. The film is all about Mike Schmidt, a dude in serious need of therapy who's having trouble holding down a job. When he was a kid, his little brother Garrett was abducted and he never saw him again. And now he's obsessed with finding who did it, and he even has nightmares about it constantly. Oh, and there was that one time where he thought a kid was getting abducted when they really weren't, so he absolutely pummeled the kid's dad right in front of him. Like I said, therapy. Mike was somehow not arrested for this, but he, he did lose his job. But outside of his very deep-seated trauma affecting both his mental state and the faces of others' dads, it, Mike lives in a cute little house acting as the legal guardian to his younger sister, Abby. All while his cartoonishly villainous aunt is trying to gain custody of Abby for some vague financial benefit, things are going bad for Mike. So, desperate for a job, he goes to see a career counselor named Steve Raglan, a character who rouses absolutely no suspicion whatsoever when he reads Mike's name, stops speaking mid-sentence, starts sweating, and is very obviously played by the person we already know is supposed to be William Afton, the serial child-murdering main villain of the entire FNAF franchise, so if they were hoping to make this a plot twist, they're not doing a great job hiding it. But I digress, I guess. If Steve here offers Mike a security gig at the nearby Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, an abandoned, rundown pizza party restaurant that is closed off to the public, but is mysteriously kept open by the unnamed owner. Hmm. From there, it's the same FNAF we all know and love. It's Steve calls in and does the whole phone guy shtick, telling Mike how to do the thing and then we'd never see him again. We get our first glimpses at Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, and later Golden Freddy, who are all absolutely insane. These are real practical effects made by Jim Henson's Creature Shop that are both animatronics and mascot costumes, which is... Oh, that's getting a little too real for comfort, to be honest. But anyway, while working his job at Freddy's, Mike meets a local cop named Vanessa, who's an absolute FNAF nerd, dude. She knows all the lore. She tells Mike about how Freddy's was a popular party destination in the 80s, until five kids went missing, which got the place shut down, and now the kids' souls are haunting the animatronics, yada, 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 whatever. Meanwhile, Abby starts hanging out with the animatronics, and they actually get along really well. But then, Vanessa and Mike catch on that the animatronics want to make Abby like them. That is to say, they want to kill her and stuff her into an animatronic suit. 
Fun. And through a series of twists, turns, and unfortunate events, the animatronics turn on Mike and Abby, leading to the biggest reveal of the entire movie, Vanessa is the daughter of William Afton, the man who killed those kids in the 80s and the man who kidnapped Mike's brother. And as if by magic, Afton then shows up in his classic Springtrap murder suit, ready to straight up kill Mike. Vanessa tries to stop him, it, so he stabs her cool, but then the group realizes that the animatronics are under Afton's control because they don't remember that he killed them. So Abby draws a picture of Afton killing them, which makes them remember that Afton killed them, so then they turn on him. I, I don't know, man. This movie's two hours long. And at long last, we get the moment all FNAF fans were waiting for. The iconic Springlock failure death scene from FNAF 3. When the souls of Afton's victims corner him as the Springlock mechanisms in his animatronic suit fail and clamp down on his body, killing him. He says the thing, I always come back. Which it doesn't really make sense why he says the thing, in this context, but whatever. The animatronics then drag him into the back of the pizzeria. Mike and Abby grab Vanessa and escape. We see the soul of Golden Freddy give Afton the death glare as he clings to life in his murder suit, doing that whole twitchy thing Springtrap did in the first FNAF 3 trailer. And with that, credits roll on the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, and millions of parents across the country just realized what they've been letting their kids watch on YouTube for the last eight years. Now, my thoughts. First off, this movie absolutely nails the aesthetic. This was obvious from the trailers, but the look of this film, the animatronics, the pizzeria, it all looks genuinely perfect. And that final sequence, the spring lock failure through to the credits, was handled so, so well. And beyond just that, I could tell from the second this film started that this was made for the fans above all else. Literally, one of the first things you see is a book called Dream Theory. I don't have time to get into all that, but trust me, it's a deep, deep reference. Of course, there's Easter eggs all over the place. References to old fan theories, characters from other FNAF games and books. The entire opening credit sequence is done in the style of those old Atari mini games from FNAF 2 and 3, which I loved. And of course, the cameos. Yeah, a handful of FNAF YouTubers were actually able to make some brief appearances in the movie. A photo of Dacos on the wall of the pizzeria. Corey X Kenshin plays a cab driver for a couple of scenes. They play the Living Tombstone's FNAF song during the credits, and even Markiplier was apparently supposed to be in the movie, but couldn't make it due to scheduling conflicts. Was that? What do you mean I'm forgetting someone? No, no, those were all the cameos. Huh? Matthew Patrick? But Matthew Patrick isn't real. You dreamed him. Ten years ago. Please wake up. Yeah, of course, I have to talk about the man himself, friend of the channel, Matt Pat from Game Theory, getting a cameo in the FNAF movie. He played a waiter at a diner, and his name was Ness. Yes, actually. His character's name in the FNAF movie was a reference to his infamous Sans' Ness game theory. Love that. And not only was it so exciting to see him just in the movie, but it was even better seeing fan reactions to his cameo on social media. I saw TikToks of audiences like gasping, applauding, and cheering when Matt showed up. And that just made me really happy. I've known this guy since 2014, almost a decade. He gave me the chance editing for him that's basically why I've been able to do YouTube for a living all these years. And he's just a really good dude and a good friend. And I'm so genuinely proud of him and how far he's come. The Nest thing is still funny though. <laughs> oh, also, and then there's a girl and this happens. <laughs> which I'm just calling it, uh, this feels like a fake out scare. These don't appear to be main characters of any kind. This hand just leaps out of Freddy's mouth, which is something we've never seen happen before. Freddy doesn't appear to be active. It, this just feels like it's gonna be a fake out scare. Like the scene's gonna be building suspense. This little jump scare will happen to keep you on your toes as kind of a joke, but then the real threat of the scene will show up as like a misdirect. And if I'm wrong, I'll drink water. Yeah, I was wrong. Wow, was I wrong. Not only was this scene not a fake out scare, but this was one of the most shocking moments of the entire movie. I assumed this character wasn't super important. That was wrong. This is actually Max, the babysitter Mike calls to take care of Abby while he's at work. But all the while she had a secret ulterior motive working with that crazy aunt to help steal custody of Abby away. She, her brother, and a couple other people break into the pizzeria to vandalize the place and try to get Mike fired. And when Max here gets a little too close to Freddy, uh, trigger warning for descriptions of gore, I guess. The hand leaps out, pulls her into Freddy's mouth where she is quickly bit in half, clean sliced from the waist down and her legs just drop to the floor. Oh, oh, oh my God. I, uh, 
Yeah, I, I guess it finally makes sense why Mike brought Abby to the pizzeria. Babysitter was busy. Now, all that being said, I do have my issues with this movie. I mentioned it was very clearly made for the fans, and don't get me wrong, that was 100% the right move, but I do think it led to some problems. This movie, to some extent, expects you to come in already knowing the FNAF lore, which is, uh, that's not a small ask. <laughs> now, for someone like me, and I'm sure a lot of you, that's that's not a huge deal. But trying to watch this movie from a less biased perspective, uh, the way it leans on you knowing the lore going in does make some of the storytelling a little weak. William Afton and Springtrap's reveal didn't get anywhere near as much buildup as I feel it needed, so that whole segment just lacked some impact for me. It weirdly felt rushed. And also, at no point does the movie really establish that Afton built the animatronics. They leave enough breadcrumbs for the viewers to piece together that he owns the pizzeria, but the only line that even alludes to him having built Freddy and the gang is when he says, I made you. Which, okay, yeah, sounds pretty cut and dried, but I imagine a newcomer watching the movie might construe that to mean he made them, as in he killed those kids and stuffed them into the animatronic suits, which is why they're all possessed and alive. Not necessarily that he's the robotics wizard who built the animatronics in the first place. Yeah, both are true, but it's kinda up to the audience's knowledge of the franchise to get that, which is my problem. This whole thing also led to some pacing issues with the film, like that cute scene where Vanessa, Mike, Abby, and the animatronics are building a fort. Vanessa is having the time of her life, that entire scene, only to turn around five minutes later and threaten to shoot Mike in the head if he brings Abby back to the pizzeria. Again, parts of this film feel real rushed, but there's also parts that feel way too drawn out and repetitive, like the constant back and forth between Mike's dream sequence. And a lot of these issues really do stem from the movie letting our prerequisite knowledge of the lore do more heavy lifting than it should have to. And speaking of which, the last thing I want to touch on here are the lore implications of this movie, because they Hey, they are something. This movie tells some version of the basic lore present in FNAF 1, 2, and 3, and pulls some beats from the FNAF novels, but does make some really weird changes. So, you know, for a quick refresher, Five Nights at Freddy's timeline starts with two dudes building animatronics in the 70s, Henry Emily and William Afton. And for this conversation, we really only need to know about Afton. This guy in the game canon has three kids, or uh, had three kids, I guess. The youngest was the crying child, who you may remember from being the kid whose head got chomped by Golden Freddy in 1983. The middle child was a girl named Elizabeth, who met a similar fate at the hands of Circus Baby and Sister Location. And the oldest is Michael Afton. Dude's the one who put his youngest brother into the Golden Freddy animatronic during the bite of 83, and the one who got his innards scooped out at the end of Sister Location and was replaced by Ennard, the uh, robotic innards. And in the lore of the game, this Mike should basically be the same Mike we see in the FNAF movie, but he's not. In the FNAF movie, Mike Schmidt is no longer Michael Afton working under an alias to set right all the crimes his dad committed. He's just a guy. He's just a guy. And as far as we know, William Afton in the movie only ever had the one kid, Vanessa. So my immediate thought was to then link her to Elizabeth, but it only took like five seconds of me considering that to toss it out. Elizabeth died when she was just a kid. Her soul is inhabiting the baby animatronic from FNAF Sister Location. And not only is Vanessa a completely different character, not only does she never mention having any brothers, younger or older, and not only is she implied to likely survive getting stabbed by her dad at the end of the movie so they don't don't even have being dead in common, but but this is Vanessa. Like, from Security Breach? The security guard that's secretly under Afton's AI mind control running around the pizza plex as both herself and as this rabbit thing named Fanny? Yeah. That's her. Okay, not literally, but look at them. They're both women in their 20s with blonde ponytails who work in some form of law enforcement job, have a decently familiar relationship with the animatronics, and some kind of tie back to William Afton. She may not literally be Vanny, but all the signs are there. And after the movie was done, I just couldn't get this out of my head. Why? Why would they create a new character to retcon an entire trio of absolutely integral members of the FNAF canon and make her virtually identical to another FNAF character who's completely unrelated? I even thought for like a split second that they were actually gonna do something with the Vanny thing. In one scene, the security monitors freak out and you see a bunch of glitchy purple text on screen. It, that screams help wanted security breach AI William Afton junk. And then the big one, when Vanessa is admitting to Mike that William Afton is her dad, she says that when he's around, she would quote, be of no help to Mike and Abby. And at that point I thought, oh, 
Oh, okay. Maybe they're gonna be introducing the whole Afton mind control concept here. Essentially making this Vanessa be under a similar control as Vanny is in Security Breach, and that's why they made her a Vanny stand-in. That's a... Uh... That's a bold choice, but no, that never happened at all. In fact, Vanessa was actually rather proactive in fighting off her dad. She shot him in the arm. That's a weird way to not be of any help, though I guess she did get stabbed. Eh, not very helpful. And honestly, it is a very, very good thing they didn't go down this route. That would be some pretty advanced FNAF lore to shove into the last 10 minutes of the first movie. And it would also be dumb. It'd be really dumb. But it would have at least made this weird Vanessa thing make some sense to me. It, clearly what we're dealing with now is some kind of alternate universe timeline of FNAF lore. Which is... Oh, oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> oh, poor Matt. Poor Matt, dude. <laughs> yeah, how this timeline is gonna progress in future films and if it will ever sync up or cross over with the games and books, that's completely yet to be seen. But that's right, I did say future movies because the FNAF movie has been an enormous success. Like, wow. Uh, real quick before we get into that, I do wanna give another quick shout out to our gracious sponsor, War Thunder. Don't forget to check out their free to play vehicle combat game on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation and claim a big bonus pack by clicking the top link in this video's description. Thank you and on with me talking at you about FNAF a lot. At the time of writing this video, the movie's only been out for a few days and it's already brought in over $132 million at the box office and on a budget of like 20 million too. These numbers are insane. Looking at the highest grossing horror movies of all time, according to Wikipedia, this means FNAF isn't far off from cracking the top 50. Five Nights at Freddy's! Wait, is that Dark Shadows? The Tim Burton movie? Yeah, I saw that, and... I don't think I'd call it a horror film. Okay, maybe take this list with a grain of salt, but the point is, FNAF is absolutely killing it at the box office. I mean, the critics hated it, but of course they did. This was a movie for the fans. And the fans showed up. So we are 100% getting a sequel. Heck, maybe two. I remember seeing somewhere where Matthew Lillard, the guy who played Afton, was apparently signed up for a three movie deal. So yeah, we'll see. The end credits may have even been not so subtly hinting at the next movie being more based on FNAF 2, which, you know, it makes sense. We had a mid credit scene with a Balloon Boy jump scare gag, the puppet's music box tune played not long after that, and the last thing you hear in the entire film is that classic distorted voice from FNAF 2 spelling out, come find me. That one actually kind of gave me chills. It took me right back to 2014, editing the FNAF 2 game theory and delving into this franchise for the first time ever. Man, man, problems aside, I had a great time with the FNAF movie. I just think it's such a special thing to exist and has made so many fans like me so excited. This is a great time to be a FNAF fan. Now I promise I'm not gonna make any more FNAF videos for a while. I'm serious, I'm gonna do something happier, like Bluey, Animal Crossing, Adventure Time, just something else.